Uh, a very good morning. I hope they finally get the presentation on. I, I believe the yesterday I told day laptops are having a tough time. Either there was an incompatibility of the codecs or the converters. So whatever. We got um, the same problem in the earlier session also. A bit late. There's some glitches I've there. I've given my laptop. Let's see it plays from there. Anyway, uh, Moita and Dr. Ajayan Prasad. I think getting the biometry right is the most important thing you can do for a cataract uh, procedure. My mouse is not working. Yeah, it's working now. Okay. <coughs> so getting the biometry spot on. Now, when you say spot on, spot on could be, you could be very happy with what you've done, but the patient may not be very happy. Now, how many of us, let's have a raise of hands. How many of us think that when the patient comes to the cataract, he's come to us for a cataract removal? Raise your hand. Beautiful. He has not come for cataract removal. He has come for clear vision. Most of us, till recently, what we were doing to the patient was, patient was coming to us, we were saying, cataract to nigal diya hai. hai, chashma hai, one ka, two ka, 0.575. Patient is not bothered whether you take the cataract out or whether you take the furniture out of his car. Patient wants vision. Unfortunately, this is the state of affairs now. And patient is never bothered your rexes were perfect, centered, five millimeter. Cornea was clear the next day. No wound astigmatism, no desmond fold. He wants clear vision. He can never even fathom what surgical trauma you went through while doing his surgeries. Everything goes out of the window if your end refraction is off, which means when you operated the patient and the patient is not seeing very clear, he thinks the surgery has gone off bad. And if the surgery has gone off bad, you're a bad surgeon. Irrespective, the surgery may be perfect. So bottom line is, thumb rule, what the patient sees after the cataract surgery decides how good the surgeon you are. So a good accurate biometry, I think, is the big, big flagpole for any kind of cataract surgery. But one wisdom, you cannot please them all. There are so many patients whom you are happy, refractions happy, refractions bang on, but the patient is not happy. He'll say, I have some shadows, I have a foreign body sensation. So you should not keep yourself under so much of pressure to please all of them. Your endeavor should be that the accurate results of the biometry are as far as possible. But one thing is, you cannot never have a 100% accuracy whenever you're doing a biometry and trying to put an IOL because of various issues which we'll discuss as we move along. But what your endeavor and your team's endeavor should be to deliver as best as possible to the given current technology and time and to the patient's expectation. It is always a good idea to have a conversation before the patient. Most of the times patients come to you thinking that, okay, spectacles will not be required. I'll share some anecdotes from my practice. What we've done is, in my consent form, there is a bold letter which says, cataract surgery is done to remove cataract it does not ensure or guarantee a 100% spectacle removal. Then there's a column says, if the patient is going for a monofocal lens, patient understands that he is going to need 100% near glasses. And then the patient is supposed to write this in his own language under that. There's a blank form. The moment he starts doing that, he starts confronting the real reality. Otherwise, most of the times, they will sign the consent form, come back on the second post-op visit and say, doctor, I can't read the near objects. And then you tell him, that was, that was the whole deal. We went for a monofocal lens. And then he'll say, no, I didn't understand that. I'm not happy. So it's a great idea to do that. Now, what this has done for me in my practice is my multifocal practice has gone up by 20 to 25%, just because of this. When the patient is supposed to write it down in his own handwriting, that I have been told that I will 100% require glasses for my near work, he pauses, he thinks, and then he says, let me talk to my son. Let me talk to my friend. I will think. I think I will upgrade myself to a multifocal lens. 
or if the patient is going for a toric, we say, okay, this lens will ensure reduction in your astigmatism. 100% guarantee is not there. So once you do these things, what you're doing is you're bringing the expectations to a realistic level. While you're doing that, your team is doing its best to achieve best possible outcomes. So <clears throat> it's always great idea to communicate to the patient that you're doing the best thing possible the given technology in the given situation is. So while you're doing that, your team should be actually committed to deliver the results along with you, but don't get attached to it. When I say that, which means when you get attached to it, you start feeling depressed that, okay, you tried so best and you tried so well, nothing worked out. But don't get attached to the results, but be committed. So what we do in our, uh, uh, I can't go reverse on this. Just a minute, yeah. It's responding so slowly. Okay, now what are the issues in biometry which you may confront? Abnormal eyes, you could have a postcorneal refractive surgery case. It could be a LASIK, RK, or a PRK. You could have a fake lens in the eye, which could be an IPCL or an ICL. Patients with silicone eyes, pediatric cases, penetrating keratoplasties, scarred or repaired cornea. So these are situations which you will confront. A perfect biometry is never a destination, it's always a journey. It's always continuing, going on and on and on. So what we do in my organization is we have these posters within the optometrist rooms, which are reminders for all the optometrists where they're working. Every day or every once a week, we audit. We audit the day's post-op. On the third post-op day on my software, we audit what are the way off? Where did the biometry go wrong? Is it a spherical error? If it's a spherical error, you know, there's an audit committee. There's an audit committee of three doctors. Who's, if it's an astigmatic error, we talk to the surgeon what has gone wrong. We review the patient, see the tilt of the IOL. You have to keep doing that in order to give 100% possible. And the patient also realizes that you're doing your best. Now, axial lens, which are smaller, or the hyperopic eyes, are more unforgiving. There's one more slide which is missing here. Anyway, axial lens in smaller eyes are less forgiving. Larger eyes are more forgiving because of the ratio of the ACD to the axial length. A little bit error here and there will not cause much problem in a high myopic eye. But in a high hyperope, slight axial length issue will cause more problems. So whenever you're seeing a smaller eye, make sure you're trying to correct it to the last decimal. Yeah, these are kind of red flags posters in, uh, in my organization. Now, the history taking is very important. I'll share some anecdotes with you. Patients will come to you and they'll deny that they've got any refractive surgery done ever. They'll deny point blank, especially women, and especially if they are accompanied with their mother-in-laws. We've seen it so often. Uh, I have a case when a lady was uh, come for a, a pre-senile cataract, my optom says, sir, keratometry 38.5 and 39.5. So I asked the history for refractive surgery. She kept saying, no, no, no. She got a PRK done eight years ago. There was no scar. But she kept denying it. And there was nothing which was fitting in. It's only that I, I made sure that I could talk to her alone. When her mother-in-law was not there, she says, yeah, doctor, I have got operation done, but I have not told my in-laws. So history taking is very important when you're doing, uh, you know, Slit land examination, looking for those LASIK marks, looking for subtle RK cuts. These things will warn you in a pre-operative workup. Axial length difference, we have a standard deviation of 0.1 set up for my practice. If there's a difference of between one, one millimeter between both the eyes, the biometry has to be repeated by the same person. And if the reading is same, then it has to, he has to call in the next optometrist to do it. And both of them have to sign in on the printout that it was repeated. This is a protocol which we follow. And since we've started doing that, our, our ratios of emetropia or happy patients has really gone up. So these are meticulous follow-ups which we do. Different formulas to be used. There are different stickers and posters in each uh, optometrist room where he comes back and does the calculation. Then he has to enter it in the software. And if there's any issue, the last one says, uh, yeah, and it, they need to discuss it with me. Somewhere it says, if there's an issue, uh, it, a mail is sent to me and the thing is discussed by me. 
Now changing from one biometry to another biometry, this is again a big issue. Most of us were doing applanation. What to do if you're shifting to immersion? There are different formulas. You need to reconfigure your A constants. If you're moving from optical to optical from uh, immersion, you need to add a bump up. These are the values. You can note them down. You can shift to optical, add these values. I, by standard, add 0.4 to A constant. If I have a reading of an immersion and I'm going to use an optical for my A constant, I add a 0.4 to it. Caution, various formulas. There are different formulas available. Hofer, Hegis. We usually use SRKT in most of the cases. In very, very short eyes, we prefer using uh, uh, Hegis. Otherwise, most of the time using SRKT. But there are good formulas. Holiday 2 is an excellent formula. We have Holiday 2. You know, we have a consultant holiday two formula. Uh, what you need to make sure is, suppose you're putting the lens, lens in the sulcus. Uh, keratometry, very important. Actually, sir, this is a very, very detailed topic. Keratometry is very important. Make sure if you're using an automatic keratometer, you should know the K constant, R constant. The values will vary up to nearly one diopter of keratometry if you've not fed the right keratometric converting constant. I'll give you a vague example. All keratometers will measure in millimeters and they convert it to diopters. The conversion factor for each machine is different. So if you're using a machine which is using a different conversion factor, but put in a different KR value, you will have a wrong value. So make sure whatever machine you're using, the formula calculation is fed according to that. Reasons for hurry are wrong. People in hurry, astigmatism entered wrong axis, compression of the cornea, probably a wrong ILK constant considered. I'll just come to now very fast. Post-RK situations, more and more patients are coming to us who are post-RK. Make sure you t t spend time with them. Tell them that the outcome may not be 100% sure because of the instability of the cornea. These corneas take time to settle down. Do not prescribe expensive glasses within first 21 days. In my situation, I've seen there are patients two, till two to three months take for the refractions to settle down. So always give a patient a temporary glass at the end of two weeks, three weeks. Tell him that the power may change because the condyl curvature gets hydrated. Now clinical history method, I'll just share some things with you. Uh, in RK, what happens is the whole anterior posterior cornea comes down. So the AC depth does get altered. Unlike LASIK, in LASIK, only the superior surface gets flattened, the interior surface doesn't get flattened. So your AC depth will not change, but your keratometry will change in LASIK. Whereas in RK, the ACD and the keratometry both will change. So you need to make sure that you're using the right formula for that. Extrapolation of from periphery to, periphery to center is very high in RK. Number of cuts is within six. It's a good result. You'll have a very stable refraction. But if the cuts are more than six, all over the world studies say it'll be an unstable refraction. You might land up with an irregular astigmatism. So if you're planning to put a toric lens in these patients, make sure you do a topography, a complete corneal power, before you realize it's a stable and a regular astigmatism. It's not a bad idea to use a topography, serious, pentacam, or an scan to find out irregular astigmatism and total corneal powers. It's a good idea to treat astigmatism in these patients. I use a lot of high uh, uh, power astigmatic uh, refractive lenses in these patients, toric lenses, provided the astigmatism is stable, last history, spectacle powers, and the patient is having a regular astigmatism. Few interesting things are these patients will have diurnal variations. They will have a different keratometry in the morning. They will have a, a different keratometry in the evening. And this is a well-documented fact that they will have to 1 to 1.5 diopters of change in astigmatism or keratometry value from morning to evening. So this, this slide explains it all. Another thing is they'll have, a, they'll have a diurnal variation and a perennial variation. These patients will never be stable. Few years down the line, they start having a hyperopic shift because the cornea keeps getting flattened. So always tell these patients that if you left them emotropic, emetropic today, they might not be the same at the end of two years. So they have to be well informed about that. LASIK, I don't think I'll need to spend much time on that, but these patients are very, very high driven. In the first place, they got a LASIK done, means they never wanted glasses. So they will try and pressurize you to say that, yo, after cataract surgery, you will not get glasses. Don't say that. In spite of having the best formulas available, Barrett's formula, Hale's formula, none of them are 100% sure. Uh, there are different options available. One thing you need to be sure is, if the patient is post-LASIK and is showing an astigmatism, you watch out. Because the reason being, normally LASIK should be correcting all the astigmatism. Isn't it so? You should have treated the cornea. But if the LASIK is showing astigmatism, please make sure you're ruling out ectasia. Number two you need to rule out is that is there a lenticular astigmatism which the previous surgeon corrected by firing laser on the cornea? And he's induced a corneal astigmatism. 
So in such a situation, it's a good idea to put a toric lens. Post vitrectomy eyes, again, I think I don't need to go into much detail, but yes, you can have an error up to plus four diopters in these patients. Make sure you put the silicone value. The, your optometry should be aware that there's a silicone in the eye. The best idea is when you're doing both the eyes together, you always get a difference, and that should raise a red flag. One more interesting thing is that these patients, if you're going to put a silicone oil, it's a great idea to do an immersion or an optical biometry before oil is put inside the eye, so that you have the baseline readings. We've started doing that. Suppose we are planning some uh, vitro retina surgery. If it's possible, we do the biometry before, just in case patients post silicone oil will have a cataract, so you have a base value to work on. One more confusing thing is these patients will a lot of have encirclage or banding. This will have increase in axial length. So silicon oil by themselves are a little tricky, but now with the current formulas available, IL master or any optical biometers is a great idea. There are a lot of manual methods. I don't have much time to discuss these, but there are a lot of manual methods also where you can do this. Pediatric IL calculations, basic simple formulas. You have to make sure I in my practice below two years, we do not put IOLs at the moment. Beyond two years, yes, and we've started putting a lot of multifocal patients in uh, younger patients, because I come from one premise that this child, as he grows, even if he has a change of refraction, it's a good idea to put one glass both for near and distance, rather than having a press biopic glass. And I'm sure there's a lot of consensus happening in pediatric surgeons. Post keratoplasty, again, I think I'll just jump and we just come to a few tips. Uh, there are a lot of online tools available. Can I open the links, please? Yeah. I'm trying to show some links which are available. Can you open this? Just click on this. I, I want to open the link. No, open the link. Double click here. There's a link here. Okay, there are, these are some downloadable EXE files, uh, Excel files which we worked. We, I've calculated nomograms for piggyback lenses, calculated nomograms for post-RK, post-PRK. I'm sorry, it's not opening. Otherwise, it's a very interesting uh, Excel sheet. Where you put in the formula, you put in the data of the patient, put in the age of the patient, put in what, what's been done, LASIK and RK. At the end, you have recommended formulas, recommended uh, IOL with the given A constant. And in case there's a piggyback, I guess it I, is stuck, I, I think. This is what happens if they don't let you use your own laptop. Uh, Dr. Kamal, considering us, uh, this uh, Barrett uh, formula or uh, Hill RK, do you think we should go to use SRKT or other formulas? Sir, in especially in post RK, more than Barrett, is the Dr. Hill uh, ACRS uh, .org formulas which work best for me. Uh, somehow in Barrett formula, especially if the keratometry is less than 36, it fails like crazy. It just, no explanation. I, in fact, I talked to Dr. Gambarat also. And he said, how many cases, you know, how many cases are less than 36? I said, welcome, come to India and I'll show you post RK patients, 32, 31, 34, post, post RK especially. And so my recommendation is beyond 37 keratometry, you can use Barrett, you can use uh, ACRS, Dr. Hill formula, Holiday L, Holiday 2, but, as you go flatter, flatter keratometry, post LASIK or post keratometry, I refrain personally from using the Barrett formula. It's not working. Actually, the, the next slide was more interesting. How to calculate piggyback it was something which you'll be, you, you'll be discussing. Yeah, I'll be covering. So, thank you.